All right, uh, welcome, uh, team, and good afternoon and good morning in Almaden. We're live streaming the event as well, and good day, everybody, for those of you who are connecting remotely. I'd like to welcome uh, all of you to the second seminar of the year of our Distinguished Speaker Series. And really, it's my great pleasure today uh, to welcome Professor Rafael Yuste. Rafael is a leading neuroscientist and professor of biological sciences at Columbia University. He has pioneered optical methods to measure and modify the activity of neural circuits of the cerebral cortex on the quest to understand how brains work. Rafael Yuste obtained his uh, MD at the University of Autonoma in Madrid and his PhD from Rockefeller University and was a postdoctoral student at Bell Labs. He joined Columbia University in 1996 and is currently the director of its Neurotechnology Center and co-director of its Kavli Institute for Brain Circuits. In 2011, Rafael led a small group of researchers to propose the Brain Activity Map, precursor to the U.S. Brain Initiative, and in 2016, he helped coordinate the launch of an international brain initiative. He's presently involved in establishing ethical guidelines for neurotechnology and artificial intelligence, what he refers to as neuro rights. Rafael received multiple awards for his work, most recently sharing the Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. Today, he'll present the use of optical methods to selectively image and manipulate the activity of neural populations in 3D in vivo and to alter behavioral choices. I had the good fortune of visiting Rafa at his lab at Columbia University uh, uh, earlier, when, late last year, and I gotta tell you that it deeply impacted me. I mean, it impacted me for the possibilities and the capability of the science and the technology, but also because of the consequences uh, of what this is all gonna mean to each of us and to our society. So I could not be more delighted to have Rafa here today and share his pioneering research with our IBM community. And uh, following this seminar, actually, Rafa is going to participate in the uh, AI ethics board that we have in IBM to discuss this very topic in more detail and discuss some of the implications and actions that we can take and collaborate together. So Rafa, the stage is yours and welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dario and Dorothea for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So the story today, starts with magnets, and this is something that uh, many of you are probably familiar with. So I'm talking about ferromagnetism, and you know that uh, magnets have this uh, very weird property, which is that if you split them apart into individual atoms, the atoms are not magnetic. But if you put them together, something happens, and the system becomes magnetic. So this is an example of an emergent property, also known as a collective property, which is a property that, by definition, is not present in the individual elements of a system, but emerges when the system is put together. And magnetism, 100 years ago, gave a lot of uh, headaches to physicists because they said, well, how can you get something out of nothing? If there's no magnetism in the atom, how can you get the magnetic material? Until this uh, uh, undergraduate student, Ernst Ising, proposed uh, a very simple mathematical model. And this is the critical equation of the model in which he describes energy of the magnet and you can imagine, uh, understand energy as the propensity of a system, a physical system to change. So you have a lot of energy, you're likely to change. And he defined it uh, with this negative integral of the sum of the um, spins of each pair of atoms times the coupling coefficient, this term J, which essentially uh, measures how strongly coupled atoms are with each other. And the higher the J, if these spins are coherent, the larger the term, which means the more negative the energy, which means the more stable the system is going to be. So armed with this equation, he predicted this existence of these states of, of matter, the spin glasses, in which parts of the material becomes magnetic because they have coherent spins that actually are, in a way, self-generated. These territories emerge, are an emergent property of the interactions of the atoms. They're not magical, they just come from the interactions of things. So, um, so this is an example of, a classical example of an emergent uh, property that has been understood scientifically. But now if I draw your attention to neuroscience, and you probably know that we don't understand how the brain works, uh, but there's a lot of things that make uh, us think that the brain is the mother of all emergent systems. Because if you want to build an emergent system, 
what do you do? You, you build a system that has many particles, many units, as many as you can, and then you enhance all these interactions because the emergence properties depend on the interaction. You, you make them as strong as possible and as rich as possible. And guess what? If you look at the evolution of the central nervous system, nature is uh, systematically increasing the numbers to the point that in our, in our brains, we have approximately 86 billion neurons Okay, astronomical numbers of neurons and the connections and the connectivity of the brain is still uh, unknown, but on average our neurons are probably each connected to about another 100,000 other neurons. So it's not an all-to-all -all connectivity, but it's, it's a huge uh, number of connections. So, well, that's exactly what you need if you're playing this emergent property game. So it's very likely that the brain uh, is optimized for the generation of emergent properties. And as I told you, it's critical for science uh, to understand the brain for three reasons. One is because it turns out that this organ happens to be the uh, substrate of our mental activity, of our minds. And as humans, we define ourselves by our minds. We are the ultimate cognitive animals. So essentially, everything that you are, your identity, your thoughts, your imagination, your perception, your emotion, everything comes from this generation of, of activity of these neurons that you have in your skull. No? So if we understood how the brain works, we would actually understand who we are for the first time from the inside, scientifically. We understand what is a human, what does it mean to, to say that we're humans. No? The second reason has to do with medicine. Uh, you probably know from personal experiences with friends and family members, that mental or neurological diseases have no cure. Uh, and it's the dark corner of medicine. And they uh, uh, afflict a large proportion of the population, which is increasing as the population is aging. And the reason we cannot uh, help these patients because as doctors, we don't understand the pathophysiology uh, of the system, of the nervous system, which is when the, the physiology, the normal function, it turns wrong. Uh, goes, uh, is defaulted, and that's the pathophysiology. So if you cannot understand the physiology, good luck with the pathophysiology. There's no way you can solve the problem. So that's another reason to understand the brain. And the third reason, uh, probably you, you realize I work in at IBM, that uh, has to do with the secrets of bio-inspired algorithms that are in there. No? Because brains, not just of humans, but of, of all animals, are computing uh, all kinds of sophisticated optimization uh, problems with hardly any energetic cost. I think the, our brain is the wattage of a small light bulb, no? and uh, and we can we can uh, achieve feats of computation that are that are uh, unheard of for for technology. Um, so there has to be the the ways in which brains compute uh, have to be uh, critical to invent new technologies in the future. No? So why don't we understand how the brain works? So it turns out neuroscience for the last 100 years has been anchored in a theory, in a uh, paradigm, which is called the neuron doctrine, which assumes that the unit of structure and function of the brain is the individual neuron. And it was actually called doctrine because uh, it was a religious belief. It was something that it had to be true. Uh, so it wasn't a hypothesis, it was a doctrine. And uh, pioneers like Cajal and Sherrington, using methods that reveal the structure and the function of individual neurons, uh, started a wave of research that continues to this day in which people have been taking apart brains one neuron at a time, describing how the neurons look like, like these beautiful images from the Cajal's drawings to uh, recording the activity of individual neurons with electrodes. Sherrington was the first person to develop the method to record the activity of individual axons of individual neurons. And what we've been doing uh, for 100 years is to record the activity of one neuron in one animal uh, and correlating that with the behavior of the animal or in one patient and correlating that, let's say, with the pathology of the patient, for example. But if this is an emergent system, to do that, it's a little bit like trying to watch a movie in a TV by looking at a single pixel. The image in a TV is an, an emergent property of the pixels. It's built with correlations in space and time and color 
of the individual pixels. And by definition, it doesn't exist in the pixels themselves. So this is another example of emergent property. So, uh, so imagine the foolishness of trying to understand something like this by looking at single pixels. No? Unless you capture the pixels all at once, you won't be able to see these interactions. So because of that, <coughs> uh, people already 100 years ago started to think that maybe the Neuron Doctrine was wrong. And it was actually someone in Cajal's lab, Lorente Deno, who studying these, these circuits, which Cajal called the impenetrable jungles where many investigators have lost themselves. And he was, he was speaking about himself because he could never figure out the logic of the connectivity of the cerebral cortex and never break the, the code there. So uh, like a good disciple, Lorente did the opposite of what he was told and spent his whole life studying these impenetrable jungles. And he came to the conclusion that most of the connections in the cortex of uh, vertebrates were uh, recurrent loops, were feedback connections. This is something that he called chains. And he imagined that the whole purpose of this is to generate what he called reverberations, which essentially means uh, that you have a circuit motif. We have an example here, like this one here on the top right, in which you have a neuron that's receiving input from the left. It's getting turned on, and it's passing that information to another neuron on the right, but it's also sending this feedback loops of connections that activate other neurons which activate it itself again. So in a way, by doing that, this is not a trivial uh, design uh, principle because when you do that, you can generate a state of activity which is independent of the input because it's self-exciting. And what Lorente thought he argues that the purpose of the whole nervous system is to do that, that it's all wired like that, to generate these internal states that he called reverberation. The reason this is important is because if you can do that, then you have something inside your head which exists independently of the world. It doesn't need sensor input to get turned on. It can be activated independently. And if you can do that, you can imagine how evolution could then use these states of activity, these endogenous states, as building blocks and as symbols for things in the physical world. And from that point on, instead of manipulating the physical world, you manipulate the model. You have a model in which these are pointers that are symbolizing things that happen outside. No? So that was the critical insight that Lorente put on the table, and this was also picked up by Turing, who came out with the same conclusion, like this is all a feedback uh, business. No? So uh, this is an example of an emergent property because it's not doesn't exist in the individual neurons. You need the neurons to connect to themselves to generate these intrinsic states. No? The same idea was picked up by Hepp, who, uh, quoting Lorente, changed the name, and instead of change, reverberate and change, he called these things neural assemblies. But the idea was identical. You have a group of neurons, in this case are the nodes of this graph, and the edges are the connections between the neurons that are all connected to themselves in one way or the other, so that means you can turn the whole thing on, and then it remains on, regardless of the input. And uh, what Hepp did propose, the originality of Hepp, is to argue that these things will build automatically if you link these neurons through um, a synaptic plasticity rule. In the HEP case is the famous HEP rule that two neurons would, neurons that fire together will wire together. So if you have neurons that are firing together because maybe they're responding to the stimulus outside and eventually they can wire together to the point they can self-excite themselves independently of the outside stimulus. And again, at that point, you essentially are off from the physical world and you can start building uh, a mental uh, world. So going back to uh, magnetism, uh, John Hoffield in 82 published a very influential paper in which he took the IC model wholesale and he applied to uh, neural networks. He argued that if you have a neural network, in this case, these little triangles are the neurons and these are the axons, and if this neural network is connected in a feedback fashion, in the ideal case where the connectivity uh, graph is complete, and if these connections are symmetric, 
he argued this is isomorphic with the icing model. And he defined a concept of energy, in this case it's not thermal energy, but computational energy, but again it captures the, the, the tendency of a physical system to change. Uh, and he defined it just like uh, Eisen did with a negative term. The V's here are the activity of the, each pair of pre and postsynaptic neurons. And the T's are the J's, the coupling coefficients. In this case, are the synapses. So if these neurons are strongly connected the, and their activity is congruent, this, you can have a very big term here, a very, very negative term. And he predicted the existence of these spin glass-like states in the nervous system, which he called attractors, which would be stable states of activity with a group of neurons would be firing in a stable or semi-stable uh, uh, duration. And he took this model and said, if you can do that, well, he predicted that this would happen the minute you have these conditions, and said, well, you can do that, and then you can build yourself a universal computer because you can build a system of attractors, stable states in the dynamics of the neural circuits. You can, in fact, understand the entire neural computation as an example of classical mechanics. And these stable states could be uh, imagined to be the solution to a computation or a memory. So uh, if the, uh, this uh, topo map would represent all the potential uh, activity states of your brain, let's say, and imagine in this case you have these two valleys, these are the attractors, and we're looking at the energy defined as I, I told you with this uh, icing uh, equation. And then um, imagine that your activity at any given time is like a ball rolling through this landscape. No? And as it gets close to the valley, it gets attracted, it drops down automatically to the bottom. That's why these things are called attractors. So this way of computing has the property of pattern completion. You can arrive to the computation or to the memory with partial information. You don't need to specify the entire path. No? So this was the Hoffield model. Uh, and I was lucky that I overlapped with John Hoffield when I was at Bell Labs. Uh, he was, we were in the same department. I had many lunches with him. And I came from the Neuron Doctrine uh, Camp. In fact, my thesis advisor was the great, great, great scientific grandson of Sherrington, so like straight, <laughs> straight through, and um, and listening to John talk about these things. Oh no, John, I mean, you completely. This, the brain is not completely connected. The synapses are not are not um, symmetric. And he said, no, 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 they don't have to be con completely connected. You can achieve the same thing with a random connectivity. And this, if the synapses are not symmetric, you cannot prove the math, but that doesn't mean that this, this thing doesn't work like that. No? It's just that our math is <laughs> it's, uh, it's poor. <laughs> it doesn't mean that the brain is not doing it. No? So, um, so I told him, well, how can we prove you wrong? OK, well, you don't have a new theory. You have to falsify it. And he laughed and said, well, it's going to be difficult because you have to record from every neuron in the brain to map all the attractors first. And then you have to be able to move the ball to any point in the landscape and then predict test what's going to happen. So anyway, so I kept that in my mind. And then uh, many years later, uh, actually, the, uh, uh, this has resulted in the Brain Initiative. And I'm not going to talk about that. But the Brain Initiative, essentially, it's the research program to develop methods to do exactly that, to map the activity of everything in the brain, to see the entire <laughs> TV screen, and to be able to put the ball wherever you want, to be able to manipulate the system in a multidimensional space so that you can actually achieve any position in this dynamical landscape. So I'm going to spend the rest of my talk telling you what we're doing in my own lab at Columbia uh, to try to advance that, that program, to explore if there's emergent properties. No? And this starts also with, uh, with chemistry. It turns out that uh, when I was at, Bell, at uh, Rockefeller working with Larry Katz, um, we found out, uh, well, how can we measure these properties? So we have to put electrodes in every cell, and this is not going to happen. Uh, you're going to turn the brain to Swiss cheese. So we decided to, to use op optics, to use light. No? Turns out that using uh, high affinity calcium chelators, you can make them fluorescent by attaching them a fluorophore. And when they bind calcium, they change the spectral properties, which means that if you make the spectrum of this uh, dye, you can tell how much calcium there is. And working with Larry Katz at Rockefeller in the Whistle Lab, we found out by chance that you can use calcium indicators to label every neuron in a neural circuit. In this case, it's a brain slice. 
So this is a brain slice of the mouse cortex. Every one of these white dots is a neuron. It's labeled, and they're alive, and they're labeled with this calcium indicator. The calcium indicator gets into the neurons, and then you can take images with a camera or a microscope and see in real time the concentration of calcium in the neurons, which was interesting if you care about calcium. But what was really lucky is our chance discovery that if we took images of the calcium concentration in these neurons over time, these neurons seem to flicker. The calcium concentration could increase and decrease. And this has to do with the fact that whenever a neuron fires an action potential, so this is an electrical recording of the activity of a neuron as a function of time, and these uh, lines are the famous spikes or the action potentials, the electrical signals, all or none that neurons uh, generate. If you measure calcium at the same time, every time there's an action potential, there's an increase in the intracellular free calcium concentration, which means that we can take movies. This is a process movie. Every uh, dot is a neuron, 10 minutes in the life of a piece of brain of a mouse visual cortex. And whenever these neurons are activated, they turn red. And the reason is because they fire action potentials and they change their calcium. So through measuring calcium, we can indirectly interrogate who's firing when. And uh, this is 500 neurons in the brain of a mouse. The mouse has uh, about 100 million neurons. So it's a little corner of that TV screen of the mouse. But in that little corner, we can see every neuron. So it's the beginning of the program to essentially watch the entire uh, TV screen and explore if there are emergent properties. So I was also lucky that when I was at Bell Labs, I worked with Winfried Denk, uh, who invented uh, two-photon microscopy. So two-photon microscopy uses, comes out of physics, um, uses a nonlinear absorption of photons by ex excitation uh, of fluorophores by infrared uh, ultra-fast photons that have two uh, advantages for microscopy of living tissues. One is because it's infrared light, it penetrates deep into living tissue. You want to image with uh, regular microscopy uh, the brain. It has the optical properties of a glass of milk, so you cannot see. But with infrared, yes, you can go in and see. You know? And the second property is the nonlinear excitation generates a, a, a point spread function, essentially a focal point, uh, which is narrowly uh, restricted uh, in space uh, to a tiny little uh, area. So that means that you have like a magic wand that you can use to focus the light deep into tissue without being dominated by scatter. And these are two fundamental advantages, which again, when we work with, on this, we didn't know they were going to be that great. <laughs> Just one of the things that, that happened, uh, luck, uh, serendipity. And, um, but nowadays, uh, many labs in the, in the country, in the world, are using two-photon calcium imaging to measure the activity of neurons with these methods in living animals. So going back to the, the gist of the talk, how about these emergent properties? Are they emergent properties in brain tissue? So using two-photon calcium imaging, we started to look first in brain slices, just pieces of the brain taken from the cortex of mice. We can keep them alive for a few hours, label them with calcium indicators, use two photon, and see who's far in there. And when we did that, uh, we noticed these big changes in fluorescence. In this case, they're plotted negatively, but they correspond to these action potentials. And uh, you can build uh, plots like this. This is what we call a raster plot, where in the y-axis you have neurons, so every y value is a neuron, and x-axis is time. And this is a graphical representation of a movie like the one that you just saw, where you have the neurons firing. In, in this case, every black dot is whenever the neuron fires at least one action potential using this calcium imaging method. And you can see these lines of, of black dots that run down. And this is a coherent activity by a group of neurons that fires together during a period of time for reasons that we don't understand. So this is something that we call ensembles, but this is the same idea that people have defined with other terms. You could, could have called them chains, attractors. It's essentially coherent uh, co-activation of a group of neurons. 
It's an emerging property because you would have never seen that if you record from individual neurons. You have to know what the other neurons are doing and realize that when you fire, you're part of a group. So we found this, discovered these ensembles in these tissues, and, uh, but then, uh, and they had very peculiar shapes. Uh, some of them were grouped. So in this case, it's an example of the neurons in red are the ones that belong to one of these ensembles. In this case, they're a group near each other. In this case, they form a layer or a little column. Most of the time, the groups of neurons that form these ensembles were spread out through the tissue, through the slice. You know? So they were located in different parts, and they were somehow no too far together. And this is, in brain slices, spontaneous activity. We weren't doing anything to the tissue. They just did that continuously. It's, we couldn't stop it. Now, because it was in brain slices, many people thought, well, this must be an artifact of cutting the brain, taking a piece of brain out of the, of the animal. But it turns out we've done the same experiments in, in living awake behaving mice, and we see the same thing. So on the top, you see a mouse that's awake. His head skull is attached, head fixed to the microscope. He's running on this spherical treadmill, and he's watching this TV screen where we're showing him some visual stimulation. And simultaneously, there's a laser, an infrared laser that you don't see that's going through the skull. And we're taking data, like this is the raw data coming out of the microscope. This is a two-photon microscope. These are the neurons. They're labeled with calcium indicators. And if you look at the raw data, you can see how these neurons are flashing. These are these action potentials. And you can now build, a, this is a, the analyzed version of that movie, uh, which we color in red the neurons that are, have statistically significant changes in fluorescence corresponding to this action potential. So this, if you look at this movie, you see these groups of neurons firing together. See how the neurons are not firing individually, they firing groups. That's the ensemble. That's what we call an ensemble. In fact, I bet you that in your brains right now, that's what's going on. And this is exactly the challenge of neuroscience, how to decipher these coherent patterns of activity and understand how they relate to your thoughts, to your memory, to your, how they build your mind. This is, in a, in a guess, this is what neuroscientists, the, the holy grail of neuroscience is to take, understand this, this code. No? But the good news is that we can actually measure this in awake behaving animals, and lo and behold, as I told you, uh, we see the same thing we saw in slices. This is the way we analyze this data. With a computer program, we detect the position of every neuron in the movie. For every neuron, we compute the fluorescent intensity as a function of time here. And then using an algorithm, we estimate the probability that the neuron has fire and action potential as a function of time, and these are these spike probability plots. And then we build a raster plot, like the ones that I just showed you earlier, in which every line is a neuron as a function of time. And you can see how this raster plot is dominated by these vertical stripes, which you can see when you collapse the activity of all the neurons in this histogram. This is a percentage of neurons that are active as a function of time. You see how the activity of the cortex of this mouse, at least in, in our lab in New York, is dominated by these little earthquakes. No? And these are the ensembles. This is what I'm talking about. This small group of neurons, about 6%, 10% of the neurons that for reasons we don't understand, they fire together for a little bit, and then they, someone else fires together. And it's essentially this jumping between ensembles that we are finding. This happens when you uh, show the animal a visual stimulus, like the one that you saw in that movie. This is an example of uh, raster plots for gratings, where we're showing the animal these high uh, contrast gratings and the, the uh, ensembles are painted in red. In other words, the action potentials that are statically belonging to an ensemble with very rigorous conservative criteria are colored in red, and you appreciate that the majority of the spikes are part of this ensemble. If we use a criteria which is less uh, rigorous, less conservative, then practically all the spikes are part of this ensemble. And that happens also if the animal is watching a movie that resembles the natural scenes that mice probably are watching in the wild, we use uh, BBC documentaries of nature, just as an example, so that they represent the right spatial and temporal frequencies of natural images. And this also turns on all these ensembles. But look at the top case. This is spontaneous activity with the light off. Either the animal is in the dark or the animal is looking at the gray screen, homogeneously gray screen that doesn't change. 
And notice how this whole it's also filled of these ensembles. The brain is not turning off if there's no input. It continues to fire, and it continues to fire with these groups of neurons. In fact, if you analyze the position and the properties of these ensembles and their spontaneous activity versus the one that are generated during evoked activity, you find that they're the same. Okay, so this is an example of uh, two ensembles from a movie of a mouse. The neurons in red are the ones that are part of the ensemble. This is an ensemble at some point, and a little few seconds, a minute later, this other ensemble happens. But then uh, if you analyze the data on the spontaneous activity of the same mouse, when the mouse was in the dark, you find that this ensemble has happened before. And that's the one in top. So the neurons that have the green circle are the ones that are repeating between this spontaneous ensemble and this evoke ensemble. Ensembles actually never repeat exactly. There's a liquid quality to this activity so that when it repeats, you can see a core of neurons that are still the same, and that's how you know that's repeating. But there's always some new neuron that comes in and some other neuron that goes out. There's some of plasticity in this type of representation. But our hypothesis is that we can identify these visually evoked ensembles in this spontaneous activity. So the idea is that when the cortex builds a response to a visual stimulus, it's using as uh, building blocks patterns that are already there. It goes back to this older hypothesis from Lorente and, and Hepp uh, and Hoffield, no, that we have these attractors already there. And they are doing some function. And then when stimulus comes in, we line them up in particular ways. But we don't come up with a new type of representation. We essentially are using these internal building blocks. So this raises the issue of what are these attractors doing, these ensembles doing. And to test that, for us, the dream experiment is something that we call to play the piano, which is the following. You make movies like the one I show you, where you take, uh, you capture these ensembles in blue on the top, and then you activate them artificially and play back as if each neuron was a piano key and you play back the same melody that you've seen, that you heard by watching these movies. No? And then you ask the question, what happens if you play that back? No? If the ensembles are important, if we play this back, something's not going to happen. If there's some sort of noise or epiphenomenon of the statistics of firing in the brain, then who cares? No, you, if you don't play back, it's like playing back noise. So to do that experiment, uh, we needed a way, because these ensembles, as you've seen, are intermixed in, uh, in these cortical territories. No? So you see how uh, there's one ensemble, another one, they're all mixed together. Neurons that are near each other can belong to different ensembles. So you have to have single cell precision and turn on one ensemble without turning on the other. And that's, uh, that's something we achieve with, uh, with the spatial light modulators. Uh, building a two-photon uh, hologram in which we can write words with two-photon lasers uh, with a phase device. This is the Fourier equivalent of that uh, word and generate the two-photon word and project that into the brain. This is a digital hologram. The student who pioneered this, Nikolenko, is a brilliant guy. He decided to uh, paint pictures of Kahal, get the face picture uh, and project it down into the brain I'd see if the brain would care that there was a light with Cajal's pictures on it. But that's what the, the graduate students do when you're not looking around. Uh, so this is our piano uh, to turn on ensembles. And then uh, we also use an opsin, a protein that we express into the neurons and is activated by light and makes the neuron fire. So this is an example of two neurons that are expressing this opsin, C1, V1, and with a holographic uh, piano, we can turn on both neurons simultaneously. They're near each other in space. This is the worst possible scenario. They're only 20 microns apart. And we have the selectivity thanks to the nonlinearity of the photon excitation and this digital holography of turning one neuron on or the other with no crosstalk so that we can really play the piano. So we started to play the piano uh, in this experiment using uh, putting a mouse uh, in the microscope and two lasers, one laser uh, to image the calcium. This is the top imaging 
path, and another laser through the SLM to generate the holography to play back those patterns. So we capture the pattern first, and then we compute the face uh, mask, put it in the SLM, and turn those neurons on in the same order, in the same uh, precision that nature has played them. So in the uh, control experiments, at the beginning, uh, we decided we're going to play the piano with our elbow, okay? trying to activate many neurons at once. These are very difficult experiments. You have to go through the skull of the animal. You need two two-photon lasers. The whole thing is really complicated. So, um, so in this experiment, Luis Carrillo, who was a postdoc in the lab, decided to stimulate the neurons on the left side of the image all at once, just as if he's playing the piano with the elbow. And this is the calcium imaging result. And, and uh, lo and behold, whenever he turned on the laser, uh, he got all these neurons on the left to fire. So he was happy. No? He's like, I can play the piano successfully with activating all these neurons at once in one half of the field. And then he comes to me and said, Rafa, do you remember those, the experiment that I was turning all these neurons at once? I said, yeah, sure, what happens? Well, guess what? These neurons are still firing together after I stopped stimulating them. So it turns out that he discovered by chance that if you activate these neurons 50 to 100 times, they bind together, they glue together up, and they become an ensemble artificially. So, and this, they start to fire spontaneously, even if there's no stimulus, okay? And that happens even a day later, okay? So this is not a minor change in the reprogramming on the circuit. This is already there, uh, still there a day later. So these are the calcium traces of these neurons, and uh, the, the dotted line represents when one of these spontaneous imprinted ensembles is firing. So, um, so this showed us that these ensembles can be created when we activate the neurons uh, with our piano. Um, and then uh, Luis said, okay, let me, this is a gross experiment. I'm, just, I'm activating all the neurons at once. Maybe that's, I don't know, it's an artifact. Let's just play the, pia the piano one ear at a time. And then he started activating the neurons one by one. And this example, he's turning on this little neuron here. And uh, whenever he turns on the laser, this is the calcium trace of that neuron, the neuron fires. So he was happy that he was playing the piano with one finger and, and that was working. But then when he played the piano with one finger in the group that he had imprinted before, very often when he played one neuron, the entire group came together. So he did pattern completion. So this is an example of a pattern completion experiment. The neurons in pink are the ones that belong to an ensemble, and that neuron 25 is the one that when he plays it, he trips the whole ensemble. It doesn't happen all the time, but uh, it does happen. So these are an example of the raster plots. These pink lines is when the laser is on, and he's turning on neuron 25, which is this one here in the middle, this guy here. So. Uh, so you turn it on here and nothing happens. You turn it on here, nothing happens. But look what happens here. You turn it on and boom, bingo. You start to get all these other neurons to turn on. And they are the ones that belong to the same ensemble. So we hit ourselves directly with pattern completion. We build these ensembles artificially, unbeknownst to us, and they have pattern completion. This looks just like a picture-perfect attractor, like the, the Hoffield model. And this, we think that the way we're doing pattern completion is that we're activating these neurons together and somehow their connections are getting strengthened, maybe through Hebbian rule. And then we turn on one and we bring them everyone else. Now, this is sort of illustrated here in this diagram uh, in which you have a period. You can think of this as memory storage. You have a period in which you imprint. By imprinting the ensemble, really imprinting a memory. And then we uh, read it out by turning on only one of the neurons. So this pattern completion was very robust. It was there even a day later. So this is an example of the uh, similar experiment. We're turning on the neuron in, in blue, tripping on these ensembles when there's a, a star. We bring the animal back to the animal facility. We test the animal the next day and turn on this neuron 19 again, and bingo, we get the ensemble back. So uh, we don't know for how long this pattern completion Occurs is still there, but it's probably many days. It's a long-term change in the in the circuitry. Okay, so that means that these ensembles are not just uh, some sort of fake uh, 
result from imaging, you can build them. So they're physical things that you can actually generate. And they have these properties of pattern completion, which are not coincidentally some of the key properties that theories had identified in these models of emergent properties. But we still don't know if they're, they're good for anything, if they're used by the brain to do any computation. We have to do this piano experiment I was telling you about. It's essentially go between the behavior, measurement, uh, manipulation, and see what happens to the behavior, this close, this loop, close loop. So the behavior we chose is to show the animal uh, stripes of flight, in this case, vertical stripes, and whenever he sees them, the animal licks. I don't know if you can appreciate the animal is licking because he saw these vertical stripes of light. And we show the animal horizontal stripes of light, we train him not to lick. So this is what we call a go, no-go task, in which showing the animal one stimulus, one visual stimulus or the other, the animal behaves in one way or the other. So in his behavior, he's telling us what he saw. Uh, this is a very robust train. In, in one week or two, we train the animals to close to 90% success. And simultaneously, we're imaging with calcium, two photon calcium imaging in these awake behaving experiments, the activity of these neuronal ensembles. Okay. So, so this is the experimental design. On the top, we show him these vertical stripes of light in blue, and that turns on this blue ensemble of cells that correspond to the vertical stimulus, and the animal licks. In the middle, we show him a horizontal bars a different ensemble, which is in between, in, interspersed with this go ensemble, turns on the green one, and the animal doesn't leak. This is the no-go. And then the bottom experiment is like, we don't show him anything. We turn on our piano, and we play back these patterns to see what he does. So this is the first experiment we did, was to activate the no-go ensemble. So uh, in this plot, it's just one example of one experiment in which the blue bars is when the animal licks. The short red bars is when we show him the go stimulus. So in the top trace, every time there is a go, not every time, but many times when there's a go stimulus, the animal is licking. The tall red bars is the no go stimulus. So when we show him the no go bar, the animal doesn't lick. No? The same animal, the same stimulus, and we're playing with our piano the no-go ensembles. And these are about uh, 10 neurons, again, in the brain of a mouse that has about 100 million neurons. And when we do that and turn on these neurons, the animal stops licking altogether. So we're blocking the licking by activating the no-go ensemble. And this is illustrated here. Maybe it's a complicated slide, but maybe look at this the performance of the mouse. This is the behavioral performance, the licking. This might start with uh, 70 to a, close to 100% success in licking for a visual stimulus. When we show him the visual stimulus with playing the no-go ensemble, there is a significant decrease in the behavior. We're controlling the behavior and making him stop licking or licking less by turning on this, the wrong neurons, so to speak. The next experiment is, OK, now we're going to turn on the right neurons. And we're going to show him the right stimulus. But we're going to lower the contrast of the stimulus so it becomes really hard for the animal to see that there is, a, in this case, these uh, vertical bars of light. No? If the, the ones you show were high contrast, 100% contrast. If you lower the contrast, not even you will be able to tell the difference if there's a bar there or not. So we lower the contrast, we show him the stimulus, the animal doesn't lick because he doesn't see the stimulus. And then in the bottom, we're showing him the same low contrast stimulus and turning on the go neurons, and look what happens. The animal now suddenly is seeing what he didn't see before. It's essentially licking to this low contrast stimuli. Uh, it's quantified again in this complicated slide, but if you just look here, this is the performance of the animal with low contrast. That's why the performance is very low, about 50%. And if we activate this go ensemble, we increase the performance significantly. The final experiment is uh, no stimulus. We turn off the stimulus, we turn on our piano, and then we activate the go ensemble. And to do that, 
uh, we use pattern completion. So we turn the neurons that we know are pattern completion neurons. So we try to do it with one. We can do it with one, so we did it with two. So we're activating literally only two neurons in the brain of this mouse with optogenetics, with this holographic device. Uh, in this case, this, these two neurons, neuron nine and eight. And whenever we turn on our hologram, they fire, not all the time. In this case, they only fire nine only fires. I don't know why, this is biology, they both fire. Nine is more reliable. And most of the time, nothing happens. But look what happens here. These two guys can trip the ensemble, the go ensemble, and when that happens, the animal leaks. That's the uh, star. This is the position of these two neurons, the position of the neurons in the go ensemble, and the quantification, I think you should look at this plot B, the performance of the animal when we activate these two pattern completion neurons and we recall the ensemble goes from 20% to 80%. So he's not seeing uh, anything in his eyes. We're just turning on the two key neurons that are tripping that go ensemble, and that generates the whole behavior. If we quantify that behavior, it's identical to the behavior that he had when he was seeing this, uh, this go stimulus. No difference in the delay to leak, the velocity in which he's leaking, the duration of the leaking. For all we can see, he interprets this as a visual stimulus to leak. No? So in a way, we're putting a hallucination in his brain by turning on these two neurons. Again, two neurons in a 100 million neuron brain. And we pres presume that this pattern completion of turning on one ensemble is generating a whole avalanche of pattern completions that is propagating through the rest of the brain until he moves the mouth and licks. So when we're doing this experiment, we notice in one lucky case that there was a mouse in which the go ensemble turned on spontaneously. Okay, so now the animal wasn't looking at the screen. We, weren't, we didn't have our piano on. This go ensemble, in this case, just lit up spontaneously, and in, every time that happened, the animal licked. So this is an endogenous activation of that ensemble. We don't, don't know why, but it correlates causally with the leaking of the animal. So that's it in terms of uh, what I wanted to tell you. So in summary, uh, I think we are finding uh, emergent properties of, of brain circuits as predicted by theories for 100 years, uh, and that this cortical activity is organized in these groups of neurons, these ensembles or attractors that are spontaneous states. Uh, I didn't show you, but individual neurons can belong to different ensembles, so they have a little bit of a combinatorial quality to them. And the temporal, spatial temporal patterns are not identical, so they also have this uh, flexibility. And uh, they can do pattern completion, uh, which I think would be critical to understand how the brain works if you think of it as a system of pattern completion. Uh, the visually evoked ensemble resembles spontaneous ones. The ensembles can be imprinted and recalled for several days. So this is an example that a physicist would call a phase transition. We've generated phase transition in the circuit by activating a group of neurons together. Um, these ensembles are necessary and sufficient for visual behavior, so they're not an epiphenomenon of the circuit. They're actually causally related to visual behavior. And our hypothesis in red here is that these ensembles are a unit of perception. So here I want to distinguish between what you could call a sensation, which is the activation of your sensory system by, by let's say, a visual stimulus or a sensory stimulus, and your perception, which is your interpretation of that sensory stimulus. In this case, we can dissociate both things. We have experiments that I show you where there's activation of these internal states without any external stimulus. We can do that artificially, or they happen sometimes spontaneous, spontaneously. So that's why we think that we're dealing not with sensation, but with the perception. And then once you're in perception, you're essentially into memory. This is, it's very hard to distinguish when you see something between your perception or your memory of that object. When you're looking at a, your grandmother, for example, are you looking at her or are you looking at the mem uh, your memory of her? So, um, so I think this could be essentially right in the line of, of fire set out by people like Lorente, in a way, Turing and, and uh, 
HEP and HOP field that are these intrinsic internal units, the one we should concentrate on because they can enable us to take apart that edifice of the, of the mind. And just to finish how this is, shows a very close link between the methods and the paradigms. The people that pioneer the single neuron methods, Cajal and Sherrington, are the same people that propose the neuron doctrine in which you can have a single neuron method, everything is a single neuron. Now if we expand the palette of methods uh, like the brain initiative is doing, and then you develop methods to watch the entire uh, TV screen of the brain, then you can start seeing these emerging properties and start getting a new paradigm coming. I wanted to uh, highlight that this was a lot of work done by uh, mostly uh, a lot of people. Uh, I would highlight uh, Jeun Miller and Luis Carrillo, who the two postdocs who did all the critical work in the last decade in my lab on, on uh, these ensembles. Uh, we have a relatively sizable team were funded by federal funding sources, and hopefully um, about to uh, sign a contract on a IBM Columbia Data Science Institute uh, contract to, uh, for a conference on brain-computer interfaces. I have a conflict of interest, a patent uh, that has to do with this piano uh, business, the holography uh, stimulation with using two photon light. And I wanted to finish with a quote from my mentor in England, Sidney Brenner, who died recently, who argued that progress in science depends on new techniques, new discovery, and new ideas, probably in that order. Thank you. <laughs>